Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gülis Barkan. I am the uh, president-elect of the American Society of Cytopathology. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited to hear about some soft tissue pathology by uh, Dr. Laurent Pantanowicz. Uh, but before that, I uh, wanted to give you a little bit of a brief background of all these educational sessions, um, in addition to um, introducing uh, Dr. Pantonowitz. Now, we all know these are difficult times for all of us, whether we are in the front lines or in the uh, laboratory or really working from home. The pandemic is on our mind all the time. We're listening to uh, television, radio, reading newspaper articles, and it's really up there all the time. Um, however, Life does go on. Uh, we still have to see patients. We still have to train our trainees. Um, with this in mind, um, we, um, as the uh, board, executive board of the ASC, the American Society of Cytopathology, came up with this um, educational series, um, hoping that it would help uh, our trainees, cytotechnology trainees, residents, uh, fellows, here in the U.S. as well as abroad, uh, to learn about pathology in the times where of social distancing where we can actually not do one-on-one -on -one training, but through these um, um, uh, internet-based uh, teaching, you can learn a little bit more and it would uh, keep us um, abreast and hopefully um, minimize the loss of time due to this pandemic. Uh, with this, I would like to uh, thank all the faculty who have volunteered uh, to be on this um, educational series. Uh, and you will see the names as uh, time goes on. We will be uh, uh, talking about it and tweeting and uh, Facebooking over social media and so forth. Uh, but also, I would like to thank the uh, ASC staff members um, like uh, Ms. Beth Jenkins, Joanne Jenkins, P Patty Huff, and everyone else who are working tirelessly behind this scenes to make uh, this seem really seamless uh, so that we could reach out to you and uh, get you educated. Uh, and thank you all, of course, for joining this webinar. So uh, let me introduce you, Dr. Uh, Laurent. Um, Dr. Pantanovitz received his medical degree in uh, South Africa. Uh, he then completed his anatomical and uh, p clinical pathology training in Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Harvard uh, in Boston. Um, he is board certified in APCP cytology as well as clinical informatics. Um, he is currently a professor of pathology uh, and biomedical informatics at the University of Pittsburgh where he is the vice chair of pathology informatics as well. He's also the director of uh, the cytopathology at UPMC. So he wears a lot of hats, uh, very talented and brilliant. He is um, moving to the University of Michigan uh, in June uh, as the head of anatomic pathology. Uh, he also is widely published in the field of informatics and cytology. Um, if you're reading any of the um, papers, is usually involved with them. His research interests include uh, non-gynecologic cytopathology, digital pathology, and artificial intelligence. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Pantanovitz. Thank you, Dr. Barkin. Hi, everyone out there from home or your lab. Um, I'm very happy to be spending the next hour with you. Uh, my job is going to be distracting you uh, to talk to you a bit about soft tissue cytopathology. So the plan is um, I will have some PowerPoint presentation and in between um, of my unknown cases that I will show you uh, to teach you soft tissue cytopathology, I will add one or two live cases that we will look at together. I have no disclosures. Now, when signing out a uh, FNA of a uh, soft tissue lesion, uh, the goal is really to help the clinician decide what to do next. And this is what the clinician, your surgeon, orthopedic surgeon needs to know. They want to know if it's a soft tissue tumor or not. If this is not soft tissue, in other words, it's a metastatic cancer of some sort, or it's a lymphoma, plasma cytoma, that patient's going to go off to an oncologist and they're not necessarily going to operate on it. So that's the first thing they want to know. Then if it is soft tissue, they want to know if it's benign or malignant. So they can plan for surgery, maybe just follow up. If you decide that it is malignant, they want to know upfront, is it in the small round cell tumor category? That patient, such as a Ewing sarcoma patient, may need some chemotherapy prior to surgery. 
If not, then they want to know basically, can you give an idea of grade? Now, they certainly sometimes understand that we cannot give the grade that you would give when you have a, a core needle biopsy or a full excision, but in the realm of low or high grade. So that's our goal. Is this soft tissue, small round tile or not? If it's not, then low or high grade. And then in that way, your surgeon can plan what to do next. So I'm going to help you do that uh, in the next uh, you know, hour, which is um, going to be very practical. By practical, I mean, uh, how do you screen these if you're a cytotech? to pass them on to your cytopathologist. And number two is if you're a cytopathologist, what do you put in the top line? So the way to accomplish that is with a very practical approach. There are well over a hundred subtypes of soft tissue lesions. Um, the WHO keeps coming up with more. Uh, with molecular testing today, we're splitting these further and further. And I don't think it's possible or practical for us on an FNA or even a touch prep with the core to subtype everyone perfectly. In fact, I think you will get burned if you attempt to do that. For example, if you just call something a spindle cell sarcoma, low grade, there's more than enough information in that for them to know what to do for management next. But if you try and subtype this and, and try and be a euro and call this a mixoid variant of solitary fibrous tumor and it comes out wrong, even if the management is the same, uh, they will think that your diagnoses are incorrect and you lose that uh, trust and rapport with your clinician. So this is how you do it. When you are faced with your sample, you want to look at two things. Number one is what's the predominant cell type? And I'm going to show you what they are. And then is there a background pattern? Specifically, is it mixoid or not? So when you're looking at the cell types, does it have the following cells? Fatty or lipomatous cells? spindle cells, giant cells, round cells, epithelial or pleomorphic cells. And probably that's all you really need to do most of the time. For example, if it has spindle cells, then you will sign this out as a spindle cell lesion or neoplasm. And if it's high grade, you can go ahead and call it a spindle cell sarcoma if you've proven that it's not carcinoma or something else. Now, you also pay attention to the background to determine if it's mixoid or not. And if it is mixoid and you're not sure what the subtype is, well, then you can call it a mixoid neoplasm. And if you think there are features that are bad, pleomorphism, areas of necrosis, uh, a lot of vascularity, then you may call it a mixoid sarcoma on the top line, but not necessarily subtype it because that can be done later on a definitive resection. So that's what we're going to do for the next hour. We're going to look at these uh, cytology cases and decide are the cells in the uh, lipomatous spindle giant round epithelial or pleomorphic type? And is there mixoid material in the background or not? And that's really your top line. And that's this is the take home message. So let's put that into practice. So what I'm going to show you are FNA samples and you have to determine, for example, on the top left, this looks fatty, so that would be a lipomatous tumor. In fact, it turned out to be a fibrolipoma uh, which we're unlikely to make that diagnosis on FNA, but that's okay as long as you said it's a lipomatous neoplasm. In the top middle is a spindle cell neoplasm, turns out to be a lyomyosarcoma. If you just call this a spindle cell sarcoma, you would be correct. On the top right is our small round cell blue tumors. This is a Ewing sarcoma. Those they do want you to subtype. Bottom left, you can see the pleomorphic neoplastic cells, but the background is mixoid. And if you call this a mixoid sarcoma, you would be correct if it came out to be a mixofibrosarcoma. Bottom middle is an epithelioid neoplasm, and if you prove this was not carcinoma, melanoma, you could favor this being an you know, epithelioid sarcoma, and in fact, this turned out to be a clear cell sarcoma. And then on the bottom right, very pleomorphic malignant cells. If you couldn't subtype this further and just called it a pleomorphic sarcoma, you would be correct because there are many different pleomorphic variants of sarcomas. So that's the goal of the exercise when you sign out these cases. Given that, let's look at case number one. This was a 45-year-old man, and he had a thigh mass that on radiology image was determined to be fatty in nature. Core needle biopsy was done. They called our cytology team on site. We did a touch prep, and we did a diff quick stain. And this was the touch prep. Uh, a 20x magnification is what I'm showing you. So. 
we don't see many fatty cells in this particular uh, field, but what we do see are some stromal cells with some degree of pleomorphism. Uh, and for a fatty tumor, this is relatively high cellularity. Or if this was benign fat, we wouldn't expect either this many stromal cells or this much atypia within stromal cells. And we were very lucky on this particular DIFQUIC sample to find a florette cell, which is this circular, circular arrangement of these stromal cells that kind of looks like a flower. So based on the touch prep alone, this is some sort of atypical fatty tumor. And indeed, that's what this turned out to be, an atypical lipomatous tumor with these characteristic florette cells. And you can see the core biopsy shows exactly where these cells came from. So in this particular fatty neoplasm, not only do we have a myxoid background, but we have way too many cells, a lot of atypical stromal cells, and we have these characteristic florette flower-like cells that we saw in the touch prep. In this case, it was shown to be MDM2 positive. So when it comes to fatty tumors, basically, uh, the most common neoplasm we're going to see is a lipoma. Those are not going to be biopsied most of the time uh, by interventional radiology, but we see those in the FNA clinic once in a while. Uh, liposarcoma is the most common adult soft tissue sarcoma, so you can expect to see that more different variants. So the way you sort these out is uh, we're looking for fat uh, that has benign features or malignant features. For the benign features, we're looking for large, uniform adipocytes uh, that don't have much atypia within the adipocytes or the stromal cells around them. For malignant features, we're looking for characteristic lipoblasts, and I'm going to point those out to you that they're not always the ones that you see in histology sections. If you're lucky, you may see pleomorphic cells, round cells, uh, and myxoid stroma to accompany that. Watch out for things that mimic lipoblasts, macrophages, or other tumor cells can sometimes ingest uh, mucin, for example, and can look like uh, lipoblasts. And fat easily gets destroyed when you process a sample, gets lost with fixatives, etc. So be careful when you process those particular samples. Now, there are a host of different lipoma variants, and um, I don't expect you and I don't expect myself to make a diagnosis of all these different variants, but I'd like to point them out because sometimes they do have these additional components that make the diagnosis difficult. For example, you may have abundance of smooth muscle, um, you may have abundance of hematopoietic elements, and that can be confusing. Let's look at one or two of these. This is an FNA of a lipoma which for most part looks exactly like normal mature fat. Um, and the way I would recommend signing these out is if the clinician is uh, considering a lipoma, send you such a patient to the FNA clinic and you FNA this and you get fat, how do you know if this is from the lipoma? Or you missed the lipoma and you actually just got uh, normal mature adipose tissue. Well, um, you know, the distinction is based on the fact that you're sure you're in the lesion and you let the clinician know that you suspect this is the lipoma, but they should follow up such a patient. This is an example of a case actually signed out by a colleague of ours, Walid Kalbus, as an angiolipoma. Uh, he was lucky enough to get an FNA that had a lot of vessels, and you can see on the very top left, the cell block actually shows a little thrombi within these vessels, which is characteristic of angiolipoma. Uh, the importance here is not to necessarily make the diagnosis of angiolipoma, but not to go down the tubes and make the diagnosis of a liposarcoma or some other soft tissue tumor. Here's an example where this is a fatty tumor, which is the myelolipoma. But in addition to the lipoma component, you have the extra medullary hematopoietic element, which is uh, you know the uh, smaller maturing uh, erythroid cells, myeloid cells, and you can see large megakaryocytes. And often it's these megakaryocytes that one is not anticipating that you know, may trip you up and you may land up calling this a pleomorphic liposarcoma. These are typically seen along the mediastinum or somewhere around the adrenal gland. So watch out for those. Now, we all train to look for lipoblasts, which are typically multivacuolated as shown in this picture. And when they're multivacuolated, the hypochromatic nuclei get indented. So we see nice scalloping like that. Uh, we often don't see such perfect lipoblasts. Um, usually what we see is uh, more univacular, uni, univacular or monovacuolated cells, such as you can see on the FNA on the right. Uh, but what helps you in this case is the nuclear atypia, pleomorphism, 
hyperchromasia. This is a beautiful picture of lipoblasts in a soft tissue uh, liposarcoma based on histopathology. The equivalent FNA shows lipoblasts. Now, we don't necessarily always see good scalloping, but you can appreciate the marked nuclear atypia in this case, the pleomorphism, hypochromasia, and irregular coarse clumped chromatin. If you're lucky, for example, this picture that Dr. Lester Layfield took and put in his textbook of a well-differentiated liposarcoma, if you're lucky, you may get a classical lipoblast, but many times, you, uh, you know, those are not present. And the reason they're not present is that not all soft tissue tumors, liposarcomas, have multivacuolated lipoblasts. You can see on the left, for example, this is a univacuolated uh, collection of lipoblasts. So that's what you will see on an FNA. We also look for additional features in these fatty tumors. Uh, and one of the other characteristic features are these branching vessels. Uh, they look like crow's feet, as you can see. Uh, and on an FNA, you may see those. So in this particular mixed li liposarcoma that was confirmed with fish for char, not only do we have these monovacuolated lipoblasts, but we also have these branching vessels and in the background mixoid stroma. It doesn't end there for us because uh, you need to look at your entire FNA sample because one of the things that could happen, for example, with the with a liposarcoma as this mixoid liposarcoma can undergo is progression to a higher grade round cell sarcoma. The arrows point out from Dr. Jason Hornick's textbook a mixoid liposarcoma that has these areas that progressed to a higher grade round cell sarcoma. And what happens is uh, sometimes there's this abrupt transition on the left from the mixoid to the round cell component. Now, the sample that you may get uh, may be confusing because this is still a mixoid liposarcoma just with many round cells uh, would still be MDM2 positive. In this particular uh, FNA sample, you can see lipo, uh, well, at least fatty adipocytes in the background and mixed with these irregular small cells, which is the round cell liposarcoma. Let's look at case number two. I'm going to show this case live, so we'll see if that works. Uh, this was from an 88-year-old female who presented with a thigh mass. Again, interventional radiology did a core needle biopsy, and they asked us to come and look at the touch prep uh, on site with them. And here is the uh, touch prep, and we'll look at it together live. Um, so as you can see, um, it's not the most cellular touch prep. But we do have um, some spindle cells. Uh, there's not much in the background in terms of mixoid stroma. Uh, there is some streaking to these spindle cells. And I'm just going to drive around a little bit and show you uh, what other areas there are on the touch bar. Uh, let's take a look over there. So if you, if you see, we again have a few spindle cells. Now, what's interesting is we don't just have obvious spindle cells. Uh, these cells, for example, on the right side of the screen are somewhat spindled, but they're also a little bit more oval and rounded up and almost approaching a small cell type of a lesion. And if I go to another area of this particular touch prep, for example, over here, if we look at this, let me just get that in focus. Um, so if we look at this, this is a spindle cell uh, soft tissue tumor, but it's it's quite cellular, and the cells are you know have have turned not just from long elongated spindle cells, but to more oval and almost approaching a round cell type tumor. So let me show you what the subsequent core biopsy mm -hmm. is. So this is the uh, corresponding core biopsy. Uh, now, the first thing that should be quite obvious to you in this core biopsy is uh, there are large gaping blood vessels surrounded by, uh, you know, thick fibrotic walls. And then we have the uh, you know, spindle cells uh, present in the background. Now, this is what this is not the typical uh, fibromatosis spindle cell lesion. This is a very cellular variant of this particular soft tissue tumor um, where the cells 
are not elongated, but more oval and almost approaching a more round cell uh, type appearance. Uh, mitoses are not that obvious over here. Necrosis is not obvious, but the large vessels are obvious. And in, and in, in, in fact, these large vessels is uh, what we call the hemangiopericytoma pattern. So with the spindle cell lesion, a hemangiopericytoma pattern, and possibly the cellular variant, uh, the immunostain that I chose to order, uh, I, I wish we could be a little bit more interactive and you could tell me which stain you would suggest ordering. Was a STAT-6. So, uh, let me just get that in focus for you. Um, so there is STAT-6. This is a STAT-6 positive tumor and therefore this is a solitary fibrous tumor cellular variant. Now let's talk about the spindle cell lesions and in particular the solitary fibrous tumors. It's not easy to make a diagnosis of a spindle cell lesion on, in cytology, uh, FNA or touch prep because there are so many spindle cell lesions that fall into this category. Mm -hmm. I've given you a list, for example, of some of the benign entities on the top, uh, ranging from you know nodular fasciitis, schwannoma, so forth to the malignant ones. Um, you know, now, sometimes it's hard to characterize the malignant ones. In this particular case, we were able to do so because of the benefit of ancillary studies. In this case, IHC was sufficient, but you can go on to fish if you need to. Uh, molecular testing is not often used that frequently. Um, but the distinction here would be is if you cannot subtype this further, the practical way to do it is to, if it's really somewhere in the benign uh, lesion, you just call it a spindle cell lesion or neoplasm, uh, this, the surgeon will know what to do with that. If you think it's malignant, you're going to be looking for not just spindle cells, but spindle cells with high mitosis, high proliferation index, necrosis, um, and then you can call that a spindle cell sarcoma. So I had pointed out that that particular core needle biopsy had a hemangiopericytoma pattern. That's due to the branching dilated vessels that have that staghorn appearance, as I'm showing you that, uh, you know, staghorn uh, uh, picture at the bottom. The things that come to mind when you see a hemangiopericytoma pattern I've listed on the left. Number one is a solitary fibrous tumor, which ours was, but also think of synovial sarcoma, a myopericytoma, mesenchymal chondrosarcoma, sarcoma, and MPNSTs. All of those can have a hemangiopericytoma pattern. We don't make the diagnosis of hemangiopericytoma anymore. It's a pattern and not a diagnosis by itself. Now, SFT, solitary fibrous tumor, which is what we had in this particular case, has a hemangiopericytoma pattern. They occur in the pleura, but they also occur in the soft tissue sites. They have variable cellularity. As you can see in the pictures on the right, sometimes there's a lot of collagen, and sometimes they have a lot of more spindle cells. And depending on where the FNA needle goes, you may have a hyper or hypocellular sample. They don't have any particular pattern, uh, even on histopathology. So there's un you're, you're not going to see anything special on an FNA. If you're lucky, you may see some blood vessels. So what I usually do for spindle cell lesions, soft tissue or pleural based, is always add a STAT6 uh, because that's very helpful. In our particular case, as you can see, we had a cellular variant of the SFT. Uh, we had very monotonous cells. They were more rounded up and oval as shown in this particular picture from Jason Hornick's textbook. Uh, always examine your cells closely for any atypia. Uh, in this particular example on the right is uh, nuclear atypia and mitosis. Uh, that would suggest, would suggest you're dealing with a malignant uh, solitary fibrous tumor. Now, in cytology, one of the things that makes a spindle cell lesion or soft tissue tumor difficult is when you have myofibroblasts comprising the sample. And myofibroblasts are, you know, sometimes the reason why people call things sarcomas when they are not. So myofibroblastic proliferations, which are ordinarily pseudosarcomas, can be mistaken for sarcomas. And the classical one, as you probably know, is nodular fasciitis and all the variants, such as proliferative fasciitis. Um, Here's an example of nodular fasciitis. You can see these spindle cells, 
which are myofibroblasts. In this particular case, maybe not that difficult. Uh, you can see many of the fibro, uh, many of the myofibroblasts kind of resemble each other. They look the same. There's not so much um, in terms of pleomorphism, atypia, and certainly no mitosis. You can see on the bottom left, there is even a multinucleated cell. What becomes more difficult is when these become very plump, myofibroblasts. You can see from this particular picture of a FNA of a proliferative fasciitis from Dr. Layfield's textbook. Uh, you know, any one of us probably faced with a FNA of this kind of a myofibroblastic proliferation uh, could overcall the atypia and suggest that this may represent a sarcoma, which would be wrong, and this patient would have, you know, too much, uh, you know, uh, surgery possibly. The other thing to look out for is, uh, you know, don't just look at one area of your spindle cell lesion. Uh, look for clues, uh, other components. Here's an example of a um, synovial sarcoma um, that has, in addition to the spindle cells, also has the uh, glandular element. So, you know, that's very helpful. Usually young patients, uh, in this particular patient, proven to be uh, fish positive for SYT. So look for uh, your biphasic synovial sarcoma. There may be other elements that are helpful, uh, you know, uh, to suggest like in an MP and ST, et cetera, you may see glandular differentiation. So pay close attention to that. Lots of things can take a spindle cell morphology, as you know, so not everything is soft tissue that spindles. You have to rule out so uh, carcinoma, melanoma, up near the chest or, you know, abdomen, mesothelioma. Um, and, you know, there are other weird things, uh, you know, many of us may have seen either through publications or a rare case, possibly in a teaching set, uh, you know, gliosarcomas, extra, you know, uh, you know, dural meningiomas and so forth. All of these can form spindle cells. So if you're able to get a cell block or a core needle biopsy to work it up through immunohistochemistry, that's the best way to subtype your spindle cell neoplasm. But if you have nothing in your cell block or you don't have a core, then call it a spindle cell neoplasm, try subtype it further as benign, malignant, uh, if it's malignant, low or high grade. Uh, and don't feel bad if you cannot subtype it. Uh, even in histopathology, uh, the WHO has uh, room for an unclassified spindle cell sarcoma. Um, many of these, um, you know, uh, even if you work them up, you will not get to a definitive answer. So it's okay just to call something a spindle cell sarcoma. Uh, don't call them fibrosarcoma. The criteria for that today are very strict. Uh, and usually it's these, you know, difficult to diagnose entities, MP and ST, post-radiation sarcomas that are hard to, to subtype on limited FNA material. Uh, best just to call it a spindle cell sarcoma. Uh, at our institution, we, we tend to look for myogenic differentiation. We add uh, bustle markers to those because it implies a worse prognosis and uh, the oncologist often wants to know that. So let's move on to case number three. This was a 22 year old man and he presented with a tumor around his knee, uh, underwent a core needle biopsy with the touch preparation. And this is the touch prep from his uh, knee soft tissue lesion. You can see on this particular diff quick preparation shown here at 40X, we have uh, these three elements. We have this nice cluster of cells. The majority of the cells that make up this cluster are these atypical mononuclear cells, you can see. But, you know, scattered throughout this, we have these large, uh, we have these large uh, multinucleated giant cells. And then we also have a lot of these uh, pigmented, this is due to hemosiderin, uh, pigmented cells and also extracellular uh, hemosiderin. So the three components are the mononuclear cells, the, the, the benign giant cells and pigment. And when you see that around the knee, it's a diffuse type tenosynovial giant cell tumor, also known as you know pigmented but a nodular synovitis. When this was resected, this is what came out uh, for the uh, tenosynovial giant cell tumor. These were the elements that we saw in the touch brick. We saw all these mononuclear synovial cells that were proliferating, these reactive multinucleated giant cells, osteoclast-like, with the abundant pigment. So this was the next category of soft tissue tumors. Sometimes you're going to see giant cells in these soft tissue tumors, and you have to separate out your giant cells. 
are the giant cells themselves benign or are the giant cells malignant? So, for example, if they're benign, this picture on the left, you may get many of those. They all kind of look uniform. The nuclei are very bland. They will not look like the nuclei of the sarcoma around them. And they look like typical foreign body giant cells. And that's what we would reserve for a giant cell rich sarcoma of some sort. On the other hand, the giant cells themselves may be malignant, such as shown on this picture here. And if the giant cells are malignant, then um, you know, you're dealing with some sort of giant cell rich malignancy, um, which could be uh, you know, an osteosarcoma or any other of the giant cell sarcomas. Watch out, as I mentioned earlier, for megakaryocytes. If you get megakaryocytes in a myelolipoma or another area of extramedullary hematopoiesis, you may overcall this uh, as neoplasm uh, as a sarcoma. So I've given you uh, a list and you should have a handout that will be coming from the ASC of what kind of lesions would you expect to have giant cells if they're benign and what kind of uh, you know, sarcomas would you expect to have giant cells. Uh, and I've given you a huge list. Of course, many things uh, may mimic giant cells. Anaplastic large cell lymphoma occurs in soft tissue. Hodgkin lymphoma with Reed Sternberg cells can involve soft tissue. So don't just jump down the soft tissue uh, path make sure that it is definitely soft tissue with the immunohistochemistry workup. I'll share this one case with you that was given to me in consultation. This was called a giant cell tumor. This presented on a, on a man's foot. And um, it's certainly not a giant cell tumor uh, because this was just tophaceous gout in which it was a very prominent giant cell reaction. And the FNA revealed mostly these giant cells. But if you pay close attention, you can see the typical gout appearance. Looking at the pap stain, you can see the gout crystals. In the background of the blood of the diff quick smear on the bottom left, you can see gout crystals. Best way is they would just polarize it and you see these nice, uh, you know, gout crystals. So, uh, you know, not all giant cell lesions uh, turn out to be soft tissue tumors. In this case, it was just gout. So let's go on to case number four. Um, again, I'm going to show you another uh, live case. Give me one second to prep that. So in this particular case, uh, our patient was a 59-year-old woman who presented with a thigh mass. And you know, thigh mass is pretty uh, common, as you've seen from these cases. Uh, the musculoskeletal radiologist at our institution did a core needle biopsy, and then they did a touch preparation, and they asked us to please come and take a look at the case. And uh, so this is uh, what the touch prep looked like. I'm going to show you now. Uh, we'll look at this together live. So it's a great touch preparation, and you can see uh, lots of small round blue cells. And um, you know, everywhere we go, there are a lot of small round blue cells. Now, what I'd like you to pay attention to is let's go to higher magnification. Um, some of some of these cells are clustered, and some are you know separated and isolated. Just going to uh, focus for us. I'm going to rewind balance. Okay, there we go. So uh, there are a couple of clues in this particular case. One, uh, we see two kind of small round blue cells. We see a little bit larger and pale uh, cells. And then in the background, we see a couple of darker cells. Uh, these are the viable round cell tumor uh, cells, and then the back one in the, in, the, in the background, the small dark ones are basically dying. Now, uh, this is a Ewing sarcoma, and one of the things that we often see with Ewing sarcoma, in, if you know, uh, if you remember, is these are glycogen rich, which is why some people like to do PAS stains with and without dye stains to prove the presence of glycogen. Um, but the glycogen spills in the background and creates a typical thyroid appearance. Uh, I will tell you that uh, with a touch prep, you often don't see the perfect thyroid appearance. For example, yeah, we see a little bit of a thyroid appearance in the background on the top left, but that's because when the uh, core biopsy touched the slide, it got smeared a little bit, so it made a thyroid 
uh, you know, appearance and made stripes. But in the in on the in the middle over here, if you can see where I'm pointing out, that is still a glycogen rich background. It's just a little more vacuolated and bubbly. But because the, the the tissue did not smear on the slide like we do with a typical FNA direct smear, you won't get the typical thyroid stripes. So watch out for your touch preps. In, in general, they resemble the FNA cytomorphology, but there are unique differences because we're not necessarily smearing these slides, we're just imprinting them onto the slide. And I will show you what the follow-up core biopsy looked like in this case. So let me just focus for you. Here's the core biopsy. Um, confirmed basically that this patient had a small round blue cell tumor. Let's get that in focus. Uh, there we go. So there was dense collagen. And in addition to the dense collagen, we have, uh, you know, these small round uh, tumor cells, which we saw in the touch prep. This, this particular case, when I did the immunohistochemistry workup, confirmed that it was a Ewing sarcoma. CD99 was beautiful, uh, strongly positive. And when I sent this for fish, the EWSR1 was positive. And so this is a case of a Ewing sarcoma, uh, which falls into the small round blue cell tumor category. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. When you get an FNA or a touch prep and it shows small round cell tumors, um, some of them may belong to the mesenchymal soft tissue category. And I've listed a bunch of them at the top and some of them may not, and it's our job to separate these out. So the ones at the top are, for example, neuroblastoma, Ewing sarcoma, desmoplastic small round cell tumor, rhabdos, and any sarcoma, for example, synovial sarcoma that becomes very poorly differentiated can undergo a, a small cell um, you know, component or appearance to it. The things you want to exclude, as all of you know, are your carcinomas like Merkel cell carcinomas, uh, lymphomas, uh, Wilms tumor, et cetera. So these require workup on site. Basically, when I get a small round blue cell tumor, um, I look for obvious features of lymphoma, such as lymphoglandular bodies. I send that for flow. If I don't see that, uh, more convinced that this is in the mesenchymal realm, I definitely want to make sure I have enough tissue either in a cell block or if the interventional proceduralist is willing to give me a core needle biopsy. So Ewing sarcoma um, is uh, an important diagnosis to make, as I pointed out. Sometimes the patients are young, so there's a lot of implications, and they often want these patients to undergo rounds of chemotherapy, sometimes up to 17 rounds of chemotherapy before they even operate on these patients. So uh, you need to make the diagnosis in this particular case, uh, and you need to make it correctly. This goes against everything I've told you so far. I've told you it's okay to put these in general buckets, but for Ewing's, um, they don't just want small round blue cell tumor. They really want you to tell them if it's Ewing's or not. So as you saw from the live case that we looked at, you, these are usually very cellular. Uh, the small round blue cells are about two to three times bigger than a lymphocyte. The light cells and the dark cells usually look for both. The light cells are the viable ones. If you're lucky and they mold together, that's helpful. If you're lucky, you will see a thyroid background. And if you're lucky, you may see some pseudo rosettes for the PNET variant of that. So here's another particular FNA sample. You can see the light and the dark cells, uh, but you don't see uh, too much of a tigroid background. This is the cell block. And, and I don't know, you can imagine maybe that's a bit of a rosette for this uh, uh, particular tumor. This was a PNET. And this particular case did have some neuroendocrine differentiation. It was synaptophysin positive also confirmed with EWSR1. Now, many of these small round blue cell tumors look the same. Uh, this is a case of an alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. You can see it's a little bit more clustered in this case. Um, sometimes with these cases, if you're lucky, you may get some you know, giant cells. Sometimes if you're lucky, they hug around vessels and you can get sort of a clue to the alveolar pattern, but not always. And uh, the key really is to make sure you have enough material, don't smear everything get a cell block. In this case, I could stain it with myogen and prove this was an alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. And even once it's formal and fixed, I could send it off now for molecular testing. 
this is to warn you that um, not everything that's a small round cell tumor is a sarcoma. He has a melanoma that is the small cell variant. You can see these small cell features and the top uh, confirmed to be uh, HMB45 positive. And again, lymphomas, myeloid sarcomas, and plasma cell neoplasms can all involve the soft tissue. So make sure that you uh, exclude those. Those do not require surgery in general, and so your, your surgeon will not operate on such a case, so uh, as in, in this particular case of Burkitt lymphoma. Let's look at case number five. This was a 38-year-old man who had a, 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 a lesion which was growing on his arm in the soft tissue space, and uh, it was growing progressively, um, non-painful. He had an FNA performed, and he has the FNA smear. It's a diff quick. And uh, you can see that uh, we have a lot of nuclei. Um, these are more rounded ovals, so this would fall into the epithelioid category. It's hard in this particular case to see any distinct cytoplasm or uh, you know, a particular area where the cells are separate from each other. So this sort of tends to form more of a syncytium. And then the material in the background is kind of dirty, granular, and you're not sure if this is the cytoplasm, is this ultrasound gel, or is this H&E precipitate? Well, I will tell you that it is granular cytoplasm, that because the cytoplasm was very fragile in this particular granular cell tumor, uh, you know, it, the cells uh, broke apart, nuclei stripped, and are now free in the background. And so this is the typical finding of a granular cell tumor. There's no obvious atypia for an atypical or malignant granular cell tumor in this case. Again, we were lucky to have a cell block, and then you can see in the cell block, uh, you can see the granular cells. Uh, sometimes they have prominent nucleoli, sometimes not, and you can confirm that with an S100 stain, which we did. So this is what an EFNA over granular cell tumor looks like. This is a difficult category, the epithelioid cells, when you get an FNA, because there's so many things that could be epithelioid, uh, not just within the soft tissue uh, group of tumors, but also the things that are not soft tissue-like. So I've given you a list of things to think about, um, and hopefully if you have a cell block, you can stain to figure some of these out. Uh, for example, you know, clear cell sarcoma of soft tissue, uh, rule out metastases to the soft tissue, rule out hematolymphoid lesions to the soft tissue. But the epithelioid categories uh, is important. One of the things that often is difficult is when you have a, an FNA like this, which is obviously epithelioid, so you call it a malignant epithelioid neoplasm. It's malignant because you can see the degree of pleomorphism, atypical nuclei, uh, you know, with this particular giant cell at the bottom, uh, we know that this is malignant and it's epithelioid, uh, it's very hard to prove if this belongs to carcinoma or sarcoma. Uh, if you do a keratin stain, which was positive in this case, you may think it's a uh, carcinoma, but because this co-expressed CD34, this turned out to be an epithelioid sarcoma. Uh, my recommendation for you is if you have a malignant epithelioid neoplasm like this that you um, start to work up and you cannot go any further, um, you know, at some point you would have to favor is this epithelioid carcinoma or epithelioid sarcoma. Uh, immunochemistry in that particular case, uh, in this particular situation is helpful. I have not given you an unknown case uh, of the pleomorphic uh, lesions, uh, but I will just discuss it here briefly. Uh, sometimes you will get an FNA or a TAT that has a lot of pleomorphic sarcoma cells, such as the picture shown at the bottom. And if you're unable to subtype this further, basically it would be a you know malignant pleomorphic neoplasm, favor sarcoma or favor carcinoma, et cetera. But to point out to you that uh, a lot of the sarcomas will have a pleomorphic variant. As you can see, there's a pleomorphic variant of rhabdomyosarcoma, leiomyosarcoma, liposarcoma, and chondrosarcoma. So if you're able to prove, for example, smooth muscle differentiation, you're dealing with a pleomorphic leiomyosarcoma. But many times, these are pretty advanced and aggressive, and it's hard to uh, you know, use immunohistochemistry to definitively subtype them. And that's okay, because even in uh, surgical pathology with histopathology samples, they cannot either, which is why uh, there is the plus category, pleomorphic undifferentiated sarcoma. These were known as formerly pleomorphic MFHs. Uh, it's the most common sarcoma in a patient over, the, over 40 years of age. 
They're usually very hypercellular. We don't have any problem diagnosing malignancy because of the anaplasia and the giant cells, obviously a lot of mitosis. So, you know, these would just be called uh, pleomorphic undifferentiated sarcomas. Here's an example of two different uh, pleomorphic sarcomas. Uh, if you didn't, so again, if you were unable to subtype this, you would just call it a pleomorphic sarcoma. On the left, we were able to prove that uh, this was a rhabdomyosarcoma with immunohistochemistry. So it's a pleomorphic variant of rhabdomyosarcoma. On the right, for this pleomorphic sarcoma, we were unable to prove any type of differentiation. So it remained a, you know, a pleomorphic undifferentiated sarcoma. Let's look at case number seven, which is a 50-year-old uh, man who had a cyst around his knee and an FNA was performed. And this is the FNA. Uh, I'm showing you a diff quick at a 20x magnification. So the first thing we see is one, this is pretty hypocellular, not too many cells. The cells that we do see are pretty bland looking, oval, some cytoplasm, there are one or two larger ones. But the background is pretty characteristic. There's this, you know, uh, magenta granular material in the background. And again, we're, we're not sure if this material comes from the cyst or does it come from ultrasound gel or does it come from, uh, you know, precipitate in your stain? Well, I'll tell you that this is exactly what myxoid stroma looks like. Uh, myxoid stroma, this turned out to be a ganglion cyst. It's hypocellular. Uh, there's no atypia. Um, the differential in this case would be a myxoma, but since this was cystic and not a soft tissue lesion, uh, it was compatible with a ganglion cyst slash synovial cyst. Um, this is exactly what myxoid material looks like. It's granular like this, which is very different to mucin, which mu mucin usually gives you, you know, much more even, wispy, uh, you know, uh, background. So when you see myxoid material in your soft tissue tumor, you can subtype it further based on how cellular it is. In our case, we had a very hypocellular lesion, so it would fall into this category. Is it a myxoma, ganglion cyst, synovial cyst, even nodular fasciitis? If it's a little more cellular but still benign, think of uh, you know entities that have myxoid stroma in them, uh, which could range anywhere from a nodular fasciitis to a cellular myxoma to a myxoid variant of schwannoma, or is it malignant? Uh, usually the number one sarcoma that, that is myxoid uh, in nature is a myxofibrosarcoma, but there are a host of others. And so my recommendation to you would be, if you don't know exactly what type of, subtype of myxoid soft tissue tumor you're dealing with, if it's a if it's belongs to the benign category, just call it a benign myxoid neoplasm or lesion. If you think it's bad because the cells look bad, and you don't know what to subtype it, just call it a myxoid sarcoma, a low or high grade, and your surgeon will know what to do uh, following that. So this is to show you, um, you know, that what myxoid material looks like in cytology samples. You, we all know from gross samples, for those of us that have dealt with gross specimens, that this is very gelatinous material, comes out sticky. Um, on on H and E sections, you can see from histopathology, the myxoid material sometimes is granular in the background, but in FNA smears and diff quicks, it's usually very granular in the background, which is a very different appearance to mucin. The differential here would be a lot of ultrasound gel. If you have a tipia associated with a myxoid background, number one, think of myxofibrosarcoma. Number two, think of myxofibrosarcoma. Number three, think of myxofibrosarcoma. Otherwise, there are rarer entities such as the myopathetal carcinomas and the myxoinflammatory fibroblastic sarcomas. But no one's going to expect you, for example, to make a diagnosis of myxoinflammatory fibroblastic sarcoma or on an FNA. Uh, they will expect you to just make a diagnosis of a myxoid sarcoma high grade. So here's an example of a myxofibrosarcoma. You can see the beautiful myxoid stroma in the background with a, uh, certainly a degree of atypia with these stromal cells, still on the low-grade end of the spectrum. This is another myxoid sarcoma, turned out to be a myxofibrosarcoma. And you can see uh, these are much more anaplastic pleomorphic malignant cells. This is on the high-grade end of the spectrum. 
I, I try never to be a euro and subtype myxoid lesions because there are so many soft tissue tumors that have variants. For example, I just took two examples out of Jason Hornick's textbook. Here's a DFSP on the left that you can see has areas uh, of, uh, you know, abundant areas with myxoid uh, differentiation. And on the right, this is a solitary fibrous tumor, the myxoid variant. So many things can have a myxoid variant or a myxoid component, even degeneration can have, uh, you know, uh, a myxoid pattern to it. And I, sometimes if I'm not able to, with immunohistochemistry or fish subtype the tumor, I will just, you know, use the top line myxoid neoplasm, myxoid sarcoma, high grade, low grade. So these are, there are a bunch of books out there. Um, uh, these are some of the books on my bookshelf that I uh, use um, uh, when I'm stuck. Um, I would like to give uh, a couple of words of thank you to folks who have uh, shared some of their pictures with me, uh, Dr. Willard Calvers, uh, Dr. Sarah Monaco. Um, so at this point, uh, Dr. Barkin, I am happy to um, turn this over to um, you. If anyone has questions, I would be happy to answer their questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Prantonis. This was a very, very nice overview of soft tissue pathology or cytology. This is a scary area for all because it's, it's very wide and vast. Um, while I scan uh, about questions, uh, there's a lot of thanks you, thank yous on the questions, actually. Um, let me ask you a question. When you do the FNAs uh, at UPMC, do you uh, put them in formalin or RPMI or, you know, any other media? Like, um, idea being you're going to do immunos, but you might need, um, you know, maybe flow or other molecular studies or something. How, how do you triage these? So, uh, it, it would depend if we're in the FNA clinic and we're doing these ourselves and we have a very active soft tissue sarcoma, uh, you know, group, yeah. So, they send us these cases to the soft tissue clinic and we would handle them in the clinic a little bit differently to when we we're called to sort of interventional radiology where there's a musculoskeletal radiologist doing them. And the only reason is because we don't do core biopsies. Uh, so if we're called, for example, for a soft tissue tumor and this is being done by a radiologist, uh, we always ask for a call. Uh, we'll do an FNA and if it's an obvious lymphoma, plasma cell neoplasm, maybe not even go on to the call. Uh, or we'll use the aspirate sample and then send that off for flow, for example. Uh, in RPMI. But if we are pretty sure that we're going to be dealing with a soft tissue tumor, it's spindled, it's, you know, these pleomorphic giant cells, uh, it's myxoid, then we ask for a call because we do realize that, number one, uh, the pattern for the architecture is going to be very helpful to subtype it with the core, and it gives us a better idea of grade, sometimes low and high grade, uh, when that becomes an issue. So that's how we triage it. In the FNA clinic, uh, we don't do core biopsies, um, and so then we wouldn't get a call. We just make sure we do a lot of samples to uh, make sure we have a good cell block. And then you put it in formalin then? Yeah, so we are a formalin shop, basically. Our cell blocks all go in formalin. So mm -hmm. uh, the reason we put in formalin is um, uh, immunohistochemistry is predominantly validated for formalin, so is fish, and so is molecular. It's not that we won't do smears, we will on occasion, um, but yeah, it goes in formalin for those reasons. For cell block, IHC efficient for, and molecular. Thank you. Now, there is a question about um, uh, this, about do you include a note about how a sample might not be representative of the entire lesion uh, when obviously no high-grade features are identified? Um, not in, not generally. So in other words, if we, I have a myxoid neoplasm and I'm convinced it's a myxoid sarcoma and I top line at myxoid sarcoma, and I will give an idea of, uh, you know, there are features that, uh, such as mitosis, necrosis, suggest high grade, great. If not, I don't necessarily say that um, I cannot exclude uh, that a high grade sample was, you know, uh, that, that, that a high grade area was not sampled. I know our bone and soft tissue division here sometimes like to do that in core needle biopsies. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly appropriate to do so, uh, but the truth is, if you really want to know what the grade of a soft tissue uh, lesion is or a sarcoma, you need to take the whole thing out. Uh, putting a needle in and just taking a few representative areas will not give you an accurate grade. Uh, we know that, and the literature knows uh, has reported that too. So, 
You can certainly do it. I don't. Um, you know, unless I'm calling out a high grade, that's obvious. But if a low grade, I don't say I cannot exclude high grade. That's good. Um, here's another question about uh, molecular. Um, actually, the question goes: Do you do core biopsy in all cases? Uh, and if not, how do you do molecular if you do not get the core? And you just said that you don't always get the core, but how do you do with the molecular testing on the FNAs? Is the question. Right. So, um, as I say, so if it's processed by radiology, uh, they're willing to do the core under you know imaging guidance. We have uh, usually more sample that way, um, and so the core can go for molecular. But if it's not, uh, we do additional dedicated passes to boost the cell block, and in that case, uh, that gets formal and fixed and goes for molecular. And you know, as many of us know from many other areas. FNA samples sometimes are better than cores because we have a pure population of, uh, you know, lesional cells uh, without a lot of the benign stroma in the background, uh, if you're lucky. So we mm -hmm. everything gets into formalin, cell block or uh, core needle bobs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that may be institution specific for us. Uh, it, it, it does work for us, but it you know, may not work in your institution. Sounds good. Um, another question is, uh, do the same diagnostic criteria apply to the mesenchymal lesions in other organs? For example, nodular fasciitis and parotid, or other lesions need to be included in the differential? Yeah, I think we always take things into uh, you know consideration where they are. For example, if you're doing an FNA of a salivary gland, there are many more things that have a nodular fasciitis apparent. Now, it may certainly be nodular fasciitis involving the salivary gland. And uh, for those of you who read the literature, there was a recent series published with that. But, you know, the differential is much broader than just in the soft tissue because you bring up salivary gland lesions that have that appearance. Same thing in the lung. So in other words, if you have a solitary fibrous tumor uh, pearl based in the lung, in addition to just the mesenchymal lesions you think about, now you start to add mesothelioma, uh, spindle cell carcinoma of the lung, et cetera. So I think, yes, anatomical sites certainly broaden to a differential. Uh, you need to think about that. And again, you may increase your immunohistochemistry panel uh, to exclude that. So if it was in the thyroid, I certainly would add thyroid markers to make sure you know, I wasn't tripped up. Uh, as I had mentioned, many of those carcinomas, mesotheliomas, melanomas, and even lymphomas can mimic soft tissue tumors on appearance. But you know, you should be able to diagnose them adequately with the ancillary studies we have today. So as a corollary to that, there's another question um, asking if you have a cell block, assuming you only did the cytology, you don't have a core biopsy, assuming you have the cell block only, uh, how far do you go to classify these lesions? In other words, do you leave it as spindle cell lesion or do you try to push it to spindle cell lipoma or something like that? Right. So... Okay. I try not to be a euro, and that was the whole point of the soft tissue to make it very practical how to sign them out. So if you try and push it too far, uh, you know, you can challenge yourself to show what a good pathologist you are, but you will get burned once in a while. And I don't think it's necessary to sign out an FNA and call it a spindle cell lipoma because it may not be. Now, even if it's not a spindle cell lipoma and gets treated the same uh, your your surgeon, your clinician uh, will still think that uh, you misdiagnosed the case, as I mentioned. And so why put your neck out and be wrong when all you have to do is call this a benign spindle cell neoplasm? You can favor something. Uh, you can give a differential diagnosis, but the management is exactly the same. So uh, my message to you would be one, uh, put your top line in, which is spindle cell sarcoma. Uh, provide your differential. You can favor your top diagnosis if you want. Uh, if immunohistochemistry, fish or molecular, you know, finds that translocation or the, you know, that very specific antibody, like I showed you the solitary fibrous tumor that was STAT6 positive, then that's great. Then in that particular case, you can top line that solitary fibrous tumor. But, you know, if I don't have that kind of support from my ancillary studies, I don't use the cytomorphology to you know, go all the way to subtyping. I don't think it's necessary from a patient management point of view. Uh, you actually may harm that patient if they have over or under treated uh, surgery performed on them, and your surgeon eventually will stop trusting you. You know, 
or because you try to subtype it, which is really uh, many times an academic exercise on FNA. Corneal biopsies is a different story, uh, and soft tissue, as you know, is very difficult, very you know, uh, and really, uh, you know, best done by a subspecialist today. So, a couple other questions, and we'll stay on as much as we can to answer some of these. Um, a couple of the questions are all focused on: Do you have a particular panel that you like using for spindle cell lesions or for epithelial lesions? Do you have? things in your mind that, you know, this is a must or that you, you stain them uh, to uh, work those up? Yeah, in general, uh, we do. Uh, we have, a, you know, there, there are panels for everything. There's a small round uh, tumor panel. There's a spindle cell panel, um, pleomorphic panel, epithelial panel. All of these things, there are panels for that. Uh, number one, I don't always order them blindly because history, clinical history uh, and clinical presentation is most important. In other words, if the patient had a previous tumor, had radiation to an area, patient's known to have a spindle cell melanoma, et cetera, then that certainly tailors things down. But if you don't know any of that, and this is the first time a de novo presentation, yeah, then I would run a panel for uh, spindle cell tumors. You know, it doesn't just include the mesenchymal lesions, CD34, actin, desmin, and so forth. Uh, also add in a couple of uh, the non-mesenchymal markers, pancaritin, for example. And if you're really concerned, S100 uh, to make sure that you don't miss melanoma, as long as S100 works in your lab on cytology samples. So yeah, panel approach for soft tissue is exactly what I do and what my colleagues do. And do you have a specific uh, panel for epithelial lesions? Uh, that's much harder, actually. Uh, the panel is not specific in that case, uh, really, because what you want to do there is just decide sarcoma, uh, melanoma, clear cell, or clear cell variant versus, um, you know, um, a sarcoma, so uh, keratins, melanoma markers, uh, and a moderate number of soft tissue markers and take it from there. But be careful in this particular case because a lot of the epithelioid sarcomas, whether they are epithelioid limar sarcoma, epithelioid angiosarcoma, epithelioid sarcoma themselves, will express keratin. And so keratin gets expressed either because that's the way, um, you know, the tumor differentiation is, it's aberrant, um, or, you know, you may get just non-specific staining. So keratin doesn't necessarily rule out carcinoma when you're working up an epithelioid malignant neoplasm. If anyone wants specific markers that I use in my own personal practice, uh, my email is on the screen and you can email me and I will give you what we use at UPMC. Mm -hmm. Sounds wonderful. Um, and we can also we can also actually have it on the uh, ASC YouTube channel. If you can maybe uh, send us a couple of PowerPoints or like a written form, we could just put it down there uh, together with the handout. That might sure. also. I will do that. Um, there is a question about how to how do you differentiate or how do you handle what is your approach to vascular lesions on cytology. Well, for the most part, the benign vascular lesions, you know, your hemangiomas, et cetera, we usually get very lousy FNA material. I mean, they may suspect hemangioma of the liver, et cetera, or some sort of vascular proliferation on the low end of the spectrum. And for those, we usually don't get good samples at all because uh, we just get a lot of blood. And even the cell block in those particular cases, uh, you know, yield mostly blood, very few cells. Um, for the atypical category, which is your know, hemangioendotheliomas, Kaposi sarcomas, if you're lucky, you get good samples and they're not diluted by blood, uh, then you can work them up. And today we have very good markers. Um, you will look for clues in those particular cases, such as uh, blister cells, which have, you know, vacuoles, or with your KS or, um, you know, other vascular lesions, you may get, uh, you know, um, red bodies in some of those, hyaline globules, etc. And on the high end of the spectrum, uh, you know, if you can prove that it's vascular in origin, endothelial, or lymphatic in origin, and it looks malignant, uh, then that's uh, easy. The problem with the vascular lesions is not to prove it's vascular, is twofold. Number one, to make sure you get a good sample, because by nature of being vascular, there's a lot of blood. So when you FNA, you, you mostly get blood. You don't have a lot of cells to work with. That's number one. And if you happen to get a lot of cells, in other words, it's a more solid variant of a vascular tumor, 
uh, is to remember that this could be vascular because they could be spindled, they could be epithelioid. Uh, you don't get the beautiful vessels with the hobnailing, et cetera, that you would in surgical pathology. So those are the two main things. Get a good sample and just remember to include vascular markers uh, and then you should hopefully get the right diagnosis. So two separate questions that I will merge into one uh, is how do you tackle FNAs when A, there's lots of calcification and B, if there's wide necrosis, widely necrotic lesion, uh, what is your approach to it? Yeah, actually, I'm glad you asked that, uh, whoever asked those questions, uh, because that happens not too infrequently. Uh, I had a case uh, um, about two weeks ago, actually, a, a woman presented with multiple nodules on her feet, uh, and it was virtually impossible to FNA them because they were hard and calcified. And the question is, you know, were these, you know, calcinosis of some sort? Um, at some point, you have to admit defeat uh, because, you know, <laughs> you can't stick that needle through calcification yeah. or even some ossifying lesions, myositis ossificans. Very difficult to do that. Uh, it's better for that to be handled by core needle biopsy. Um, same thing with necrosis. Necrosis is um, not, it's helpful to tell you you're dealing with a, an atypical lesion, whether it's due to infection or whether it's due to a benign soft tissue lesion like a rheumatoid nodule or whether it's a high-grade sarcoma. Uh, staining pure necrosis is difficult because the staining results may be spurious or nonspecific because of the necrosis. Uh, the key there is, just like we do with every other lesion in the body, is you need to sample viable areas. So if all we're getting is necrosis, if you're doing it in the FNA clinic, pull out your ultrasound machine. If you do that yourself, find another area that looks different on ultrasound and then sample that area. Uh, and same thing if your radiologist uh, is doing this, tell them that all you have is necrosis, ask them to please sample another area uh, uh, and get more viable cells because otherwise you're just going to report out necrosis. So there are a couple other questions about uh, rapid on-site evaluations on these. Do you do rapid on-site evaluations? And if you do, do you prepare, do you prefer um, FNA and smears or do you prefer touch imprints uh, of core biopsies? Um, are there any preference and how to handle these? So, yes, when, when these are done outside the FNA clinic in interventional radiology, for example, and they request that at our institution, we do. We are comfortable providing rows for soft tissue pathology. Uh, we do that frequently. Um, we usually start with FNA to make sure we're in the right lesion, know what we're dealing with. And then if we confirm that this is mesenchymal, uh, we will need core needle biopsies for architecture and grade. Um, if it's not, for example, obvious plasma cell, neoplasm, myeloid sarcoma, uh, we often don't go on to the core needle biopsy. Many times we're called when uh, they've decided to proceed with core needle biopsy anyway and just have foregone the FNA. Uh, again, we don't abort the ROSE procedure. We will perform on-site evaluation with a touch prep, which is still helpful, uh, which can guide them. We do have difficulty in the very fibrotic specimens where there's a lot of dense fibrosis, collagen, uh, and we don't get a lot of cellularity. In those cases, um, you know, it's hard to provide an on-site evaluation other than a few atypical stromal cells. Uh, and we also sometimes have difficulty for the myxoid lesions because they're very sticky. Uh, and, and all we can tell them is you're dealing with a myxoid neoplasm, go ahead and get a few more calls. So the answer to your question is yes, we do, Rose, and yes, we'll take whatever we get, FNA, and or touch prep. Sounds good. There are actually a lot more questions coming, if you don't mind spending just a couple more minutes here, and then uh, in another uh, couple of minutes, we'll stop and we'll ask everybody to email the questions to Joanne Jenkins so that we can answer them. But let's stay on for a little bit more. There's a question about next generation sequencing compared to RT-PCR and cytologic smears. Uh, I know this is totally beyond the scope of the subject, but um, how are they performing? Are there any issues with the uh, uh, molecular tests uh, performed on cell blocks? Okay, good question. So um, if we have uh, a choice of samples, definitive resection versus a core or FNA cell block, we'll usually go with the definitive resection 
to get uh, molecular testing done. Uh, but if that is not an option and all we have is a core or a cell block, then uh, we'll certainly try that. At our institution, we don't have a next-gen sequencing panel specifically for sarcoma. That's a send-out. Um, so we send that out where they run a sarcoma panel uh, for us. Um, uh, so the answer to your question is, if cell block is the only sample available, we will attempt it. But if there are better samples, such as a corneal biopsy or a definitive excision or a section, we would prefer to do it on that. Are there any minimum numbers for molecular testing on cell blocks and soft tissue pathology? I don't know. Whoever asked me that question, can you tell me? Because, um, you know, we go with, uh, you know, numbers between 50 and 300 for carcinomas. I've never been told that the number is different for sarcomas. I haven't mm -hmm. seen literature to that effect. So we go with the carcinomas, which is 300 tumor cells. 300 Someone tumor cells. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, and oh, one last question. There's quite a lot more coming. Um, would it be adequate to call something low-grade spindle cell lesion or tumor since it may be difficult to know if a spindle lesion is benign versus malignant low-grade spindle cell carcinoma? Yeah, I, you know, if, I, it, if we're on the benign or low-grade end of the spectrum, and I'm not sure if I'm dealing with a lesion reactive or a neoplasm, um, sometimes I won't make that distinction. Just call it a spindle cell lesion slash neoplasm and say that because it's really on the benign low end of the spectrum, I'm not sure if this is a spindle cell lesion, in other words, you know, nodular fasciitis versus, uh, or just reactive fibrosis versus a, a true neoplasm, um, uh, if ancillary studies are not helpful to sort that out. So, uh, you know, as I say, I, I'm not going to be a euro in these particular cases. Um, mm -hmm. We just don't have enough cells or architecture to work with to sometimes sort those out. And the cytomorphology is not that helpful because there's a lot of overlap in these uh, low-grade, benign, uh, you know, overlapping lesions. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much. There are a couple more questions, but I don't want to take too much of anybody's time. So um, those of you who uh, feel like your questions were not answered, please email uh, Ms. Jenkins, who's uh, running this uh, from uh, the ASC staff side. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Perfect. <laughs>